chapter 21, again, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He, he says in Luke's account that this is their day, that they should have been watching for this day. And we talked about that last week, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, 77 week period, seven, seven something, so seven sets of years are, are ordained and determined for the people of Israel and for the holy city. And this was their day. Jesus did not commit himself to the city beforehand. There's, there's a reason why so frequently he would say to uh, his disciples or to people who were healed, he'd say, don't, don't tell anybody yet. My time is not yet. And now this is his time. He is manifesting himself to them as the Messiah, as the King, as the one who they had been waiting for and who the prophets had spoken of, and yet they did not receive him as king. There wasn't a delegation of religious leaders uh, waiting for him saying, save us. Instead, they're saying, hush up these little children. And um, he is rejected by the people who should have been watching for him. And remember, we, we talked about that. It's just a great one to know that um, from the going forth of the decree to rebuild the city and the streets of Jerusalem, there will be, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and uh, these, this will happen during troublous times, and then the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, right? So you count forward from March 14th of 445 B.C. when this decree was given in Nehemiah chapter 2, when King Artaxerxes Longimanus says, go rebuild the city, and Nehemiah goes, you start counting forward from that day, and you end up at this very day when Jesus tells his disciples, hey, there's going to be a donkey waiting. Loose the donkey, bring it to me. I'm going to ride in and offer myself to the religious rulers as the Messiah. And what are they going to do? They're going to reject him. And so, once this happens, there is a threefold rejection going on, and uh, well, three illustrations, more than that, actually, four. Um, he's going to talk construction, he's going to talk gardening, and uh, he's going to curse a fig tree, and that's what we'll pick up this week. So we will read from chapter 21 of Matthew, verse, hmm, I guess we'll pick up, it's in verse 12. Uh, we'll read through to the end of the chapter, and we will look at the parable of the wicked vine dressers a little bit, but mainly the parable or the, uh, the cursing of the fig tree that Jesus does. So, Matthew 21, verse 12, he has presented himself. He's not hailed, so he goes cleaning. He's setting things straight. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and, healed, and he healed them. It's great. Those who had physical vision had no spiritual vision. And instead of coming to Jesus to be healed, to be announced as the Messiah, it's the blind and the lame, those who the Jewish leadership would have despised. They came to Jesus and they were healed. Verse 15, but when the priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. This is very interesting because it was common for children to cry out and to be part of these celebrations. The Jews are very family-oriented, and uh, they knew that God created the family as the first institute in the Garden of Eden. When he created Eve to be Adam's wife, in the beginning he created them male and female. Male and female, he created them. And a family was a very important thing. They understood that the the blessings of God through the inheritance that he gave them in the land was carried on through having children. And so having children and having them raise up in the traditions of Judaism was very, very important to them. So they weren't upset that they were crying out, um, 
save now or Hosanna to the son of David. They were upset that they weren't saying, Rabbi Gamaliel, you're the best, right? The, the praises were for Jesus instead of for the religious rulers. And so this begins to show, we saw in verse 12 and 13, that they're selling goods that should have been made to bring salvation, to bring a covering, a temporary atonement for their sins. And they're making money off of the grief of people and them wanting to get right with God and they're profiting from it. And so they are showing themselves not to be the shepherds of the household of Israel. They are showing themselves to be thieves and to be wolves among the congregation in sheep's clothing. And so Jesus, of course, is going to be bothered by this, right? It says that the rabbis, the religious rulers, were indignant that they were praising Jesus. And Jesus is the one who has the right for the indignation, and he showed that in cleaning out the temple. And so um, they said to Jesus, verse 16, do you hear what these are saying? And, and Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Again, another one of these statements where he's like, get into the scriptures. I remind us all again, every trial, every trouble, we are created. This universe is created about how the scriptures unravel. There is nothing that is going to happen in this world that there is not an answer for us in the scriptures. Mankind will never out-evolve the scriptures, right? That is not going to happen. We are created by God in the image of God. Some might think that through transhumanism we're going to evolve past all these things, but that is not the case. Man was made to live uh, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Jesus says, haven't you read your Bibles? And what's great about this, um, we'll we'll turn there to Psalm 8 um, because it's just so good. Jesus quotes a psalm to them, and these are the religious leaders. They would have known the rest of this psalm. Jesus says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. So this is perfect praise. And now let's go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 8 and read the whole thing in context, just because it's really good. To the chief musician, on the instrument of Gath, a psalm of David, Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. So just a wonderful praise to who God is. And in verse 2, we see this quote, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained praise. So now the, the God, the Lord, the Lord who is excellent and his name is above all the heavens and the earth, he is the one who has ordained praise out of the mouth of babes. Isn't that great? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing nursing infants, you have ordained strength. So now we see in the New Testament sense that if you need some strength, it's paralleled with praise, okay? This is very good, and we've all found this to be very true in our lives. When we praise the one who loves us, we praise the one who has given us not only life, but everlasting life and the forgiveness of sins. Our strength is so, so brought back to us. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Why? Because of your enemies. (laughs) So here are the enemies of God making the temple of God into a den of thieves. And Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures, you enemies of God? that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. So there is such a a turn of tables, those who believe themselves to be the religious rulers, to be holy and the ones who uh, are worthy of adoration. The one who alone is worthy of praise stands in his father's house, and when the children cry out in praise, he receives that, and it reveals that Jesus is the one who deserves this praise, and that the religious rulers have become the enemies of God. When I consider, verse 3, your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which were ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. Now, Peter will say that there are certain things that need to happen. The church needs to be known for good works so that when those who are unbelievers, when they are visited by God, 
They will bring glory to God in that day. In their day of visitation, they will bring glory to God. Now, here is the place that is God's, the resting place of God's name. The place where God has said, I have put my name and my inheritance, and this is my piece of land, and I guard it, and it is mine. He visited in the very person of Jesus, in the house that he made, right? Well, was built for him. But this place that was built for God to meet his people and those who were the shepherds, the stewards of this household did not recognize him. They did not glorify God in the day of their visitation. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Back to Matthew chapter 21. So we see the stage is set here. There is a unified rejection of Jesus by the political leaders, and he is going to now illustrate God's rejection of them. This is a very frightening thing. At times in the Old Testament, when the glory of God departed from the temple, when the glory of God departed from Samson, when someone goes from thinking, I am all that, there's a special anointing on my life, and I can do whatever I want. And when God says, no, you, you can't do whatever you want. And Samson tempted God and tempted God and tried God. And he bordered right on the edge of sin over and over again until finally the means of his strength was figured out. He did say it and his hair was cut off and he did not know the spirit had departed from him. Israel is in a place at this time when they were so built up in their own religious vigor, in their own traditions, and in their own hypocrisy that they would greet one another in the marketplace and call each other doctor and rabbi, and they would begin to believe these words that they would say of each other to one another, and they began to be so deceived that when God showed up for their day of testimony, for their day of visitation, excuse me, they scalded him. They scalded the children who were praising in the right. Verse 17, then he left them. (laughs) What else are you going to do, right? Uh, He left them and went out of the city of Bethany, or to Bethany, and he lodged there. So uh, probably going to um, Mary and Martha's house where Lazarus had recently been resurrected, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to this city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said, let it, let no fruit grow on you ever again, immediately. Ever again, immediately the fig tree withered away. So here's the cursing of the fig tree. So now I'll read um, to the end of the chapter because we'll include the parable of the wicked vine dressers because Jesus is going to use two horticultural illustrations. You see, Uh, In the Old Testament and the New Testament alike, the vine, the olive tree, and the fig tree are all pictures of Israel in certain ways. The vine is the spiritual privileges of Israel. The olive tree are the religious privileges of Israel. And the fig tree, which we see here, is the national, it's the national, excuse me, the symbol of the national privileges of Israel. And the reason I say privileges He's going to curse this, and then we'll look at Matthew 24, 32, where Jesus explains a little bit more about the fig tree, and we'll see that it's the privilege that they have as a nation, and um, there there was no privilege for a long time. Privilege brings about fruitfulness, and there is a spiritual shift where the fruitfulness of the gospel lands upon the wild vine. That's... Christians, and and there is natural vines that were broken off, not all of them, but some of them broken off, that the wild vine, the church, can be grafted in and bear this spiritual privilege. And so we'll look at the, the national privilege and the spiritual privilege of Israel 
and God judging that, and there was repercussions of that. So verse 20, and when the disciples saw it, they, were, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also you also say to this mountain, be removed and cast it into the sea. It will be done. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, when they came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders and the people confronted him as, as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Apparently, they have not been listening at all and they are challenging him again. But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you what authority I do these things. So Jesus is using great logic here. The wisdom of John, where was it from? From heaven or from man? And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. That's not that he wasn't going to answer them or not proud of the authority that, that he did these things, but if he tells them plainly that he does it by the authority of God, then possibly they would have arrested him at this point. He is waiting for a very specific day. He enters Jerusalem four days before the Passover, fulfilling the action of the lamb and the action of the, 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 uh, the people who are worshiping, that the lamb is, is examined for four days prior to the Passover, prior, prior to it being put to death on the eve of the 15th. You shall kill it on that, on that evening, 14th, 15th. And so he is using wisdom, and he, he corners them, and they are afraid to say because they fear the multitude and they perceive that John was a prophet. So Jesus says, then I will not answer you either. But what do you think? Verse 28, a man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not go. But afterward, he regretted it and went. And he came to the second son and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Jesus asked them. They said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now, this is backing up other things that he had said. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, he did not afterward relent and believe him. Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went to, into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that he might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Now, Jesus is speaking of the prophets. He said in another place that to which of the prophets did you not do this to? And again, he sent afterwards other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Verse 37, then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. Now, this is the grace and mercy of God. In his foreknowledge, God, of course, knows what's going to happen, but he's going to give them every opportunity for repentance. In verse 38, in this parable, he says, but when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize him, seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of that vineyard comes, you know, he would have turned and locked eyes with them, I'm sure here. Therefore, when the owner of that vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, they, they answer rightly, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease the vine vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their season. Jesus said to them, 
Have you never read the scriptures? Quoting now from Psalm 118 and Isaiah 28. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. He's emphasizing their very words. He will lease it, excuse me, uh, he will destroy that wicked vine dresser and uh, destroy them miserably. So this is the very destruction that they, just, they, they mentioned and Jesus is saying and he will grind them to powder. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking to them. So they have the perception, they have the understanding. They're not imbeciles, they're not ignorant, but they're spiritually blind and, and their desire for riches and covetousness and the praise of men had made them in a place where when Jesus came and received this, they instead received envy instead of being filled with humility and praised him and asked him to be their king. Instead, he rejected them. And that's why Jesus quotes from the Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. I love that. Jesus is not only the chief cornerstone, he is the capstone. He is the Alpha and the Omega. You see, we are a holy temple, and we are built up in the Lord. Let's turn to 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10, and look at that real quickly as we build this. They gave up what God had for them, forfeited it, and, and God will always have a family. God will always have worshipers, and he, he doesn't go without that, and so he works so that he can bring about his end in all things. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4, Peter builds on this whole thing, builds on the idea that Israel was disobedient to the gospel to which they were also um, ordained. Let's see, where's the word for that? Uh, disobedient to the gospel, which they were appointed, um, and Jesus is that living stone, and we come to him as living stone. So let's read now at 1 Peter 2, 4. Coming to him, Jesus, as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what God had intended for Israel to be a spiritual, spiritual house, not a den of thieves, a holy priesthood, a priesthood who honored and glorified him, and they weren't, they rejected him. Now, Gentiles, the goyim, the nations, those whom the Jews were saying were created for the, to fuel the fires of hell, have now become a holy priesthood to God. And why have we? That we may offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. When Jesus came, he offended, he stumbled the Jews, and it was an offense to them, and they crucified him. And it says, they stumble being disobedient to the word. Now, you go all the way back to uh, chapter 1, verse 25, it says, now this is the word which we, of the gospel which was preached to you. So they stumble being disobedient to the gospel, which they are also appointed God appointed salvation to them. He appointed the word to them, and he appointed free will to them, but yet they, they stumble at it. They will not have this man stand in their place of morality. They will not have this man stand in their place of punishment. That's an atrocity. How could someone else pay for my sins, right? And so they are stumbled and offended by this because they perceived themselves to be holy. But when Jesus shows up, he sees that their faith is full of holes. 
They are incomplete. They are Swiss cheese and they stink. And so, Jesus curses that fig tree and he gives them a story illustrating that when, when the master comes, what will he do to you, vine dressers? On your own, read Isaiah chapter 5. God created a goodly vineyard and in it he plants trees and yet it brought him no fruit. Christian, remember, God wants to see fruit in our lives. So, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Wow, this is amazing. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. They rejected the chief cornerstone. They stumble over that chief cornerstone. So God says, I will raise up a new family that will trust in me by faith and they will be a holy priesthood and they will bring praises to me. Now, verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived he was speaking of them. Their inheritance, their Old Testament promises, now have been moved away and put on hold for another day. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they, the, the multitudes took Jesus to be a prophet. So, again, fear, they can't answer questions. Fear, they can't uh, do what they want to do because they fear man. They're fearing the acceptance of, of humanity. And we are to fear nothing but to fear God. If we fear God and God alone, it makes us very bold in our lives. So now let's take a look again at this fig tree. Luke, um, Luke's account, John the Baptist has a, uh, excuse me, let's, let's read Luke 13, 6 first. There, there we go. Luke chapter 13, Jesus spoke this parable, Luke 13, 6. And it's got a fig tree and vineyard. So we're, we're sure that we're listening to the right thing here. So again, the fig tree representing their national privileges and the vineyard, their spiritual privileges, where the olive, olive branches, their religious privileges. And uh, this, would be, this would be gleaned actually from, uh, oh, what is his name? Oh, I don't have it in my notes. Um, Oh, bummer, can't remember. Uh, the fellow who did a lot of uh, drawings to illustrate biblical things, um, and it'll click to me towards the end of the sermon here, but um, this isn't my fresh idea. So Luke 13, 6, Jesus speaks this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So now we have a fig tree in the vineyard. So we know we're talking about Israel and their spiritual um, privileges and this brings about a national privilege for them. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. The King James says, Dung it. I like that. That's kind of funny. Let me dung it again. If it bears fruit, well, but if not, after, after that, you can cut it down. So Jesus is speaking of this parable and uh, this, this fig tree and this, this olive garden, excuse me, this, this vineyard that has a fig tree in it, and it's not bearing any fruit. Jesus shows up. He inspects for fruit, and there isn't any. And it just reminds us of the, the words of John the Baptist, Luke 3, 7. I'll read it to you. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to, to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid at the foot of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the warnings had been there. The 
forerunner of Jesus. He was speaking the same thing. Jesus shows up to inspect the fruit and he doesn't find anything. Instead, it's sour apples that he's finding instead of nice, sweet grapes. And so he does this illustration to show that Israel now, nationally, will come to a temporary end. Now, there is 70 weeks appointed for Israel. The first 69 are contiguous, but then this final seven-year uh, week, or uh, seven-year period, um, is a time that is broken off. There will be a covenant made. The people of, of the prince who are to come, there will be a destruction of the city. So Israel is destroyed. Jesus prophesied that. He said to them that he's prayed for them, but Israel's going to be, or Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And it's not going to be a good thing. So there's an end to Jerusalem, just like he said politically now, nationally, that Israel will have a short end. And that was done by uh, Titus Vespasian. He is the axe head that was laid to the, the base of the tree, and he cut down Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, Jesus speaks one more time or another other times, but one that's great in Matthew 24, verse 32. That's a good one to turn to and mark as we look at this. Jesus' disciples on this Olivet Discourse, which I'm just so excited to get to in a few weeks, Matthew 24, they ask for a sign, and in asking for a sign, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Jesus gives them three signs. This is a great way to begin interpreting this. He gives them the sign of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When you see this, that's a sign. And he says to them, now learn this parable. Excuse me, I guess the second sign is verse 30. When you see the sign of the Son of Man coming in, the, in, in, the, uh, in heaven, and that's Jesus coming in the clouds. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he ascended in clouds. So the sign there is when you see Jesus in the clouds. No. But then he also gives the sign of the parable of the fig tree. In Matthew 24, 32, now learn this parable. So he has closed out the tribulation in verse 31. And it will be a regathering of the Jews from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem, God scattered them, and very interestingly, at the end of their lifespan, at the end of their age, if you will, before that generation passes away. Um, Psalm 90 verse 10 tells us that they will suddenly fly away. It'll, it'll look like death for them, and they will fly away. How will that be? They are harpazoed back to Jerusalem so they can meet Jesus there and meet his, his bride, the church. So, that all happens, closes out in verse 31 at the return of Jesus. Verse 32, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch is already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. As we know, uh, fig trees have an early fig and they, they, they bear fruit before they bear leaves. Now, that's fantastic. In the Old Testament, the very first time we see fig trees is people trying to be religious with it. Adam and Eve, they knew they were naked, and they went and sewed fig leaves together. They made some fruit of the loom, and they put those on to hide their nakedness from God. And it's, it's representing this religious action. And you should see leaves, and you should see fruit. Now, what's interesting about a fig tree representing Israel nationally, we know that in uh, was it, uh, March 17th, 1948, is that the, the birth date of Israel? I can't believe. Sometime in the spring of 48, May 14th, there it is, thank you. May 14th of 1948, Israel became a nation. And then after being born as a nation, the birth pangs began immediately. And Isaiah prophesies, shall there be a birth? Shall a child come forth without birth pangs? Now it's very interesting. Fruit happens on a fig tree before the signs. So the fig tree very much so represents Israel. There should be fruit there, and then there's signs. So when we see the generation that sees these things, sees Israel become a nation, and they aren't, they're, they're beginning to have some leaves, right? Nationally, they're there. They were born in a day, and then comes the labor pains, then came the wars. But 
Do they have fruit yet? Fruit genuinely speaks of spirituality. They bear no fruit. Ezekiel chapter 37, 36, the dry bones prophecy. Israel has come together as a nation. Ezekiel is asked, can these bones live? And he says, Lord, you know. And then he sees many bones in the dry valley come together. And there is this bony nation standing there. And he says, can they live? And Ezekiel says, Lord, you know, and he says, prophesy to them, prophesy to the wind. And there's a time coming when we will see the beginning of the spirituality of Israel happening, when there will be fruit on them. And now learn this parable from the fig tree when its branches already become tender and puts forth leaves. What the fig tree has been cut off in 70 A.D., But now in 48, it has come back to life. No, that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near. What is near? If it says at the doors, I just have to go. Again, I'm a little rapture happy in my life. But when it says at the door, I believe that's just speaking of the sudden return of Jesus for his church. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So, Israel is a nation. Israel is back at it again, but are they alive spiritually? No, not at all. They are, they are as pagan <laughs> as could be. They have religion, but they don't have the gospel. They don't have a relationship with God. They are, for the most part, very atheistic, Israel is today. And this is is fine, but it shows us that we are in the midst of prophecy being fulfilled. They are being gathered together as a nation. This fig tree that was cut off in 70 AD is now back in the land, and their nation is beginning to sprout. And there will be a time when their spiritual privileges will be returned to them. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 is the, God's future plan for Israel. Now, it's kind of interesting. There's those who are replacement theology people. That's not theology, replacement demonology people. It's a doctrine of demons. They believe that the church has spiritually replaced Israel. For a period of time, the church receives spiritual benefits because Israel is put on the shelf for a period of time. But if Israel is replaced by the church, are we also then the fig? And are we also the vine? Absolutely not. The, these, these, these parables break down, plus in the Scriptures, every time in the New Testament that it talks about Zion, oh, which is great because Zionism is growing. So if you are a Zionist, if you are in favor of Israel coming back and possessing the land and having the land that it was theirs, that God gave them, that they fought for, that they won over and over again, if you are in favor of Israel existing as a nation, then you are a Zionist. And then you are now going to be an enemy of many, many people in power today because they would love to see God's promises never come to pass, right? So God's got a future plan for Israel. He's not through with the Jew, uh, to quote John Corson. (laughs) So Romans chapter 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. Okay, their, their stumble, their rejection of Jesus is not an eternal fall, it was a stumble, but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, just like the Crusades did, right? We are to provoke the Jews to jealousy in, in our loving relationship with God. They are to say, wow, I believe in, in the God of the Old Testament, but your relationship with, with him through Jesus provokes me to jealousy, and that's our job. Salvation has come to the Gentiles because of this. For if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, that's you and I, how much more their fullness. So God has a future plan for them, and there is a fullness that is waiting for the Jews, and how much more will this be a beautiful plan for the rest of the world? For I speak, verse 13, to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, 
and save some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciliation of the world, right? Reconciliation has come to the world, come to uh, through the gospel of Jesus, that we may be reconciled unto God. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay, there's a resurrection awaiting for them and for the whole world with this final thing when Israel becomes part of God's family again. For if the first fruits is uh, blessed by the benefits, the privileges of being parts of God's family because they, they never really lost that. Verse 16, for if the fruit, first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. So Israel is the first fruit and we are the lump. It's kind of a, kind of a low title. Hi, I'm a lumpian. Um, but the lump is holy and if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, that some branches, not all, God is not severed Israel from his future promises because Paul himself is a Jew. And so, being a wild olive tree, were granted in, excuse me, grafted in among them and with them because became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So, being grafted in, even being wild, we partake of the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. God's future plan for Israel. For if you were cut off out of the olive tree, which is by nature wild, wild by nature, and were grafted by grafted contrary to nature. Now, he uses this contrary to nature. In nature, you take the wild olive and then you cut it off and you take the cultivated olive, and you put it on there. And it saves the wild vine from producing un unusable fruit. But it's the opposite. We are the wild vine being grafted into the cultivated vine. So it's contrary to nature, the way that it works, but it works for us that we receive the fatness and the goodness, all that came through the keeping of the Scriptures through Israel and the Messiah coming through Israel. And now we receive this, and it's reconciliation for the, for the world. For you were cut off, verse 24, out of the wild olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, it's an interesting thing when people forget that God is not done with the Jew and they believe that the church has replaced the Jew. They are ignorant according to this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. We can see it with those religious rulers. The blind and the lame were being healed in the temple, but they were blind and did not see the Messiah. So blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, this is not the times of the Gentiles, but this is the fullness. When, when all of the Gentiles that God knows will be saved have come in, then that's the fullness of it. And then Israel, all Israel, and so all Israel will be saved. That is as it is written. Now, this is a very difficult and troublesome thing because after the end of the tribulation, when two-thirds of the Jews on the planet die through the tribulation, one-third remains and they will receive the Messiah as theirs. And so all surviving Israel at the end of the tribulation will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, the beautiful blessing that we have is God has taken away our sins. But as we read there, that we continue on by faith. And if we, as God's people, don't continue by faith any longer, if we continue on by works or if we blind ourselves um, with, with uh, false humility and religious activities like the Jews had done, then we will find ourselves, if you will, cut off. 
Now, I believe that this is foretelling, this is another way of, that Paul says there will be an abomination of desolation. Excuse me, there will be an apostasy, a falling away from the faith. And when the church no longer, Luke chapter 11, when Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And it's a rhetorical question. When the church stops living by faith in the Son of God, that's when God will say, you are no longer representing me. The church has become so apostate I'm now going to remove the church because the fullness of the Gentiles is complete and I will begin to pour out my Holy Spirit on the Jews. And we're living at that time. We're living at a time when it is getting very near and very close. So, would you please play the song here and we'll finish passing those out. And remember, pre-open that first one. It's a It'd be quite a trouble to get this open. But the reminder that the times are near. Prophetically, we're seeing Israel blossoming. We're seeing leaves on the trees. God is preparing to bring forth the early figs in them. But those figs happen through a great tribulation. There will be a lot of trials. I'm going to play. I got one. Thank you. So let's take a moment. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Me from Blending this life too. From my wandering heart to you. Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. But the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope for you. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That I have done by your grace is all in one, nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood. No, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Nothing. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm. 
Mm. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that, that flow. And Jesus' blood was shed for us. Lord, as we hold these elements in our hands, and Lord, we're exhorted to not be hypocritical. Lord, I just feel to, the need to turn to a couple of scriptures and just remind us, God, how important our walk with you is. Lord, the, the warnings that branches were broken off because of unbelief, then we should also fear. Help us, God, to stand fast and, and to live by faith, to trust you, Lord, in all of the things. But, Lord, to most of all, God, not to be hypocrites, not to be judgmental, not to be like the fruit of Judaism. That is not a fruit of Christianity. In Romans chapter 2, Paul wrote, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that judgment of God, the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Do you think, O oh man, that you who d judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Help us, Lord, to not be hypocritical. Help us, God, to see ourselves in the light of God as those who not only needed salvation, but who receive salvation, who receive salvation through the shed blood of our Savior, who stand sure and steadfast upon the rock of our salvation, Jesus, on the foundation that He has laid for us, that we need not to work, that we need, need not to labor, and we need not to fear. But we, Lord, come to You humbly as sheep who have gone astray and have now returned, Lord, to the over-shepherd, overseer and shepherd of our souls. God, that there's no boasting in that that there is just humility. And Lord, help us, God, to love you. For even the early church was exhorted that they had lost their first love, left their first love. You tell the church in Ephesus, behold, I'm coming quickly. Oops, wrong page, there we go. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. And if they will not repent, he will come quickly to them and remove their lampstand. We can see the breaking off because of whatever got in the way. The breaking off of their grafting in was removed. The lampstand, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church was removed. And we pray, Lord, that we would fear this O oh Lord, that we would be like the little children in the temple who desire to sing praises of you, for you. God, and we'd realize that praises are our strength. And Lord, as we see all of these things beginning to come to pass, and we see Israel being a nation, we see the labors for the temple to be rebuilt in, in Jerusalem, we see this outcry of the Jews saying, we need a man to rule and lead. God, as we see the elements of the tribulation forming before us, God, may we realize that Satan is going to raise up his ugly head against us like never before, that we need to be close to you, that we need to be under your wings and just enjoy, Lord, the beauties of your protection, the beauties of your grace over our life. Lord, to not wander from you at all, but Lord, to always be seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, Lord, and then knowing that through faith in you, Lord, everything we need will be added to us. So, Father, we just ask, Lord, your forgiveness for the places in our own lives where we have been prideful, where we've been arrogant or judgmental, Lord, where we've put on pretenses and tried to show ourselves to be more religious than we really are. Forgive us, Lord, for this, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have just an authentic, genuine Christianity before you, to know that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for us, to bring us and keep us in humility of saying, Lord, you alone are worthy. Lord, we pray your blessing on us. We thank you, Lord, in the, in the very night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he said to his disciples that this is is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together.
In the same manner, Jesus took the cup. He illustrated to his disciples that this is the cup of the new covenant in his own blood. It's interesting how a covenant can only be done away with by the death of the testator, the one who wrote this old covenant. And Jesus was coming to die, not only to pay the penalty for our sins, but to take the old covenant, which was just not capable of saving, and to implement a new and better way, a new covenant in His own blood, that we who come to Him are washed and we are cleansed and we are sanctified all through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us on our behalf because we are sinners. And because we've come to Him and, and we've accepted the application of this blood and we've, we've applied it over our own sins and we've said, yes, Lord, You are good. Yes, Lord, You are holy and I need Your holiness. For without it, I am lost. I deserve Your damnation. I deserve hell. And since we've come to Him in humility, He continues from Emmanuel's veins, that fount flows forever and ever to cleanse us an ever-living, ever-present help in time of need, that it never runs dry. Like the spring of Gihon and the temple, that it just gushed forth for the people. Lord, help us to remember, Lord, that as you were pierced in the side, blood and water flowed forth, showing, Lord, you died of a broken heart and showing that we are washed through the water of your word. And may, may we, Lord, understand and appropriate the holiness, the washing that has been done for us through this blood that was shed. May we continue to come to you holy and humbly, Lord, not in hypocrisy, not with a pretense, but just to say, Lord, I need your washing. Father, I pray your gracious blessing on us, Lord, as we take this cup and we just remember what you've done for us and that we would find, Lord, in you a complete restoration for our souls. Let's take the cup together. We thank you, Lord, for this cup, for this blessing, this time of fellowship with the Father at the Lord's table where we commemorate our great Savior, Jesus, for he paid it all. Let's sing that last song one more time, please. Let's go ahead and stand up and sing. Wash away my sins. What can make me whole?